So thanks a lot for having me here today. I'm excited to talk about ESG investing. So uh, ESG is becoming a big thing in the investment world. There are a lot of people who are committed to taking ESG into account in their investment, trying to make the world a better place uh, as they invest. But there are some big questions. How do you really do it? How do you incorporate, incorporate ESG into your investment views? And does that really raise your returns or does it lower returns? And it's a very heavily debated issue as we've already heard this morning. Uh, I've been to several conferences where there are some people who say, well, of course ESG must necessarily raise returns because investing in good firms must be a good investment. Other people say, well, it must necessarily lower returns because it's an extra constraint and more constraints should lower returns. What we'll try to do here in this paper, which is joined with my colleagues at AQR, Sean Fitzgibbons and Lucas Pomorski, who's also here today, they will talk about what is the theory behind this and what's the evidence. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time summarizing because I'll show you in detail the results, but uh, the first key result is that we can really think about the investor's problem through what we call the ESG efficient frontier. I think many of you knew of you will know the mean variance efficient frontier, and we think that this ESG efficient frontier will be an equally uh, useful tool to think about your portfolio. We'll talk about why certain measures of ESG may in fact be associated with higher returns and other measures will be associated with lower returns. We think not e all ESG measures measure the same thing. We think the theory can help us understand why they're different and why some of them may be associated with higher returns and others might be associated with lower returns. And I'll show you that as we go through the empirics. There's obviously a, a big literature here and I can't cite the whole thing, but we heard about Merton, uh, in Alex Edmonds talked about Merton's uh, theory about certain stocks being less recognized. Rather than modeling in this way, we'll think about investors who care about ESG, but think about it the full spectrum, have a measure of ESG scores for different stocks, and they may uh, have both an informational value and a preference. So in, in our paper, it's gonna be key that ESG really plays two roles. ESG is informative about what kind of company we're talking about. Is it a wasteful company? Is it a company that with w good governance, that's good at growing the pie, uh, and other things like that? Uh, so that's one part of it. So it'll tell us about future profits, but ESG also affects the investor preference as separate from profits. And, and so these are the two roles of ESG that will help reconcile some of these conflicting studies we've seen. So this is actually has a link to an old, old theory uh, by a famous paper by uh, Becker on what he calls taste-based discrimination. So he talks about, for instance, in the labor market, there are some employers who discriminate, who will only hire sort of, let's say, non-minorities who will discriminate against the minority. Uh, and, and so that has a link at least from a mathematical perspective, to our model where some uh, stocks with, with good ESG preferences are, are preferred to those with bad ESG pref uh, preferences. But at the same time, there's also what's called statistical discrimination, which is that you know these uh, different uh, social groups may actually have different properties, and, and even if you're not sort of, if you don't have a taste against minorities, you might update your, your, your beliefs about uh, different uh, stocks in, in our case, just in, in based on looking at their ESG again, because it could be informative about profits. There's also a more sort of direct link of this literature because this literature shows that if there are people who discriminate against minorities, minorities will have a lower wage relative to their productivity. So therefore non-discriminating firms can hire these minorities at a lower wage for their productivity and therefore those non-discriminating firms will be more productive so that's an, an example where sort of the social aspect of being non-discriminating can be good for profits. But let me get into the actual papers. I'll first show you what it looks like from an investor's perspective, then I'll get to the question of does it raise the lower returns, and then I'll show you some more empirical evidence. But let me start with the theory. So we have a model with a risk-free rate, we have a number of risky assets that returns are, and so what's new here is that for every asset, it's not just that we have a return that has an expected return and a risk associated with it. We also have for every stock an ESG score. And for now, we're gonna keep that general, but in an empirical setting, I'll tell you how different ways of measuring it in practice, okay? And then we have three types of investors, and that's gonna be really important for our, our theory. 
So we will talk about ESG unaware, ESG aware, and ESG motivated investors. So the ESG unaware, they completely ignore ESG information. They compute the expected return and risk without regard to ESG, and then they just optimize their risk adjusted return. The ESG aware, they actually take into account that the ESG score can't be informative about risk and expected return. So they take into account, for instance, that it could be that a well-governed firm might deliver higher returns or have a different risk profile. But you know, once they've made that judgment, they do the normal investor optimization and maximize their risk-adjusted returns. And then lastly, we have these ESG-motivated investors who also use the ESG information, but also have preference for higher ESG as separate from risk and return. Okay, so this last type of investor is what's new. They have some wealth, they choose their portfolio X of shares of the risky assets. And I won't go into the details of the math other than to say that the typical thing you see in a finance textbook is that, that the sort of the old classic Markowitz problem for which you won the Nobel Prize says that investors should maximize the expected return minus a penalty for risk. And what's new here is we sell plus some increasing function F, and it can be any increasing function uh, of the average ESG score. So X prime S is the total ESG score and divided by sort of the sum of the weight. So that becomes the average ESG score, okay? So let me show you in a picture how we solve this. So let me first go back to a picture I think anybody who ever took a finance class has seen before, where on the x-axis we have the risk as measured by standard deviation of volatility. On the y-axis we have the expected excess return, or expected total return in this case. Okay, and then we have some individual assets. Every asset has a risk and a return, so an individual asset will be somewhere on this plot. But then for every level of expected re return, we can ask, is there a portfolio that minimizes the risk? And the answer becomes this hyperbola here, the blue hyperbola. And then typically we'll say, well, investors, they want high returns and low risk, so they should probably be on this mean variance efficient frontier. It doesn't make sense to be on the lower end of the, the curve. They want to be on the top part of the curve. And then uh, we say, well, what if there is a risk-free asset? Let's say in this case it's 2% then you can actually combine the risk-free asset with the best combination of the risky asset, the one with the highest Sharpe ratio, which is called the tendency portfolio. And the Sharpe ratio is, is the slope of this curve and the tendency portfolio maximizes the Sharpe ratio. So that's sort of the classic theory. Now we wanna say, suppose investors care about expected return, risk, and ESG. So people love this curve and we thought, well, we could draw a three-dimensional plot but people really love two-dimensional plots. So the problem is here, how do we take these three things, risk, expected return, and ESG, and squeeze it into a two-dimensional plot? And the key insight really is that from this plot, we take away that from risk and expected return, those two can be summarized by Sharp ratio. Because Sharp ratio is really how much expected return do you get per unit of risk, and that's really the key. So then we are left with two things again. Sharp ratio and ESG. And so that means that we can plot on the x-axis the ESG score and on the y-axis the Sharpe ratio. And so here we imagine, for instance, let's say ESG goes from zero to one. So let's say zero is the worst offender and one is the most sustainable firm. And we have then, again, individual assets because you can pick any stock. That stock will have some ESG score. Again, that's what's given for every stock and it's gonna have some Sharpe ratio. But then we can also ask, suppose we must have an ESG score on average in our portfolio of 0 0.4, what is the maximum Sharpe ratio we can get? It's still uh, satisfying that the ESG must be 0 0.4, and the answer to that is this blue curve. And we get this hump-shaped curve here where the peak of the curve is the tendency portfolio from the previous li slide, actually. So why do I know it's hump shape? Well, because we know that there is one portfolio out there that maximizes the Sharpe ratio. That's what we had in the previous, that's that portfolio. That portfolio has some ESG score, and let's suppose in this example is around 
and it has some sharp ratio. If I tell you your ESG score must be any higher than 0.6, or any lower than 0.6, you cannot pick the tendency portfolio, therefore you must get a lower sharp ratio, therefore this curve must be hump shaped, okay? And the, so the usual tangency portfolios here, we get this hump shape, and what we call the ESG efficient frontier is the right hand side, because typically investors, they want a high sharp ratio, and they want sustainable firms, they want to be somewhere here. Now, if you are ESG aware that in some sense you you, you want to use ESG information, but you don't have a preference for ESG per se, you just want to maximize performance, then you want to pick this portfolio. But if you are what we call ESG motivated, that you really also care about ESG for, for other purposes, then you want to put yourself somewhere to the right of the curve. And if you go a little bit to the right, actually, uh, we show that that has almost no effect on the Sharpe ratio. This is because this curve is flat at the peak. The first order effect is zero, so you can actually f have a first order improvement in ESG and only a second order drop in sharp. But, but obviously if you go far out this curve, eventually uh, you'll have a drop in the sharp. So, so that uh, is something we'll also study empirically. And then finally, we had, remember we had these ESG unaware investors. So the ESG unaware investors, they also do the normal thing of trying to buy the, the tendency portfolio, but their tendency portfolio is actually not the same because they're using suboptimal measures of expected return, suboptimal measures of risk, and therefore the tendency portfolio that they pick will actually potentially be lower than this curve because if ESG is indeed informative, and again, that's gonna be an empirical question, how informative is ESG, uh, then ignoring ESG, being unaware of ESG, can lower your sharp ratio. So you can have these three investors, the unaware, the aware, and the ESG motivated, picking three different portfolios. The aware should get the highest sharp ratio, and whether it's the motivated or, th or the unaware will get a higher sharp ratio will depend on the strength of, of, of these effects. Okay? So again, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the theory, but we, we show that under our assumption, it is in fact correct to trade off Sharpe ratio and ESG to, to look at this curve. We also show what that ESG Sharpe ratio looks like mathematically, so we can solve in close form exactly what is this curve. And we can also show exactly what do the portfolios on the curve look like. And in the sort of classic example that you'll find in most finance textbook, the Markowitz solution has what's called two fund separation, which is every investor should buy some combination under his assumptions of the tendency portfolio and the risk-free portfolio. In our case, it's actually four portfolios. There's, we have four fund separation. Everybody should buy some combination of the risk-free portfolio, the normal tendency portfolio, the minimum variance portfolio, and what we call the ESG tendency portfolio, which is basically using ESG scores as if they were measures of expected return. So this can actually be interpreted as a theoretical foundation of what's called ESG integration, that you want to integrate the ESGs in your portfolio selection directly in your op as part of the optimization, as you optimize risk and expected return, where ESG comes in both because it's informative about risk and expected return, but also if you care about it separately because you know, you can tilt towards high ESG in an optimal way by looking at this portfolio. Okay, so that's really thinking about it from an investor's perspective. You can take, you know, find your favorite measure of ESG and then compute the ESG sharp ratio frontier, the, look at the ESG efficient frontier, and then decide where do you want to be on that frontier. But what about this question, does it lower or raise return generally to buy high ESG stocks. For that, we need to think about you know, several effects. So we have, again, these ESG scores given, and then now we're thinking about you know, how does that affect the, the firm value, the future profits of the firm, but also how does it affect the price? And then, you know, if you get a certain amount of profits for a given price, you know, that basically will tell you the future re stock return. Now the stock return, I've so far taken it as given, thinking from the investor's perspective, that, that's a given. But now as we think about you know, 
what will it be in equilibrium, we have to solve endogenously for the price and the stock return. So that becomes part of an equilibrium, and we need to solve for that. Okay. And so now, again, we have these three investors, ESG, unaware, aware, motivated. Before I said they had some ways of, of thinking about returns. Now, actually, the returns are endogenous, but, but, but the unaware will, will just think about future profits in a more naive way. The aware will take into account that ESG is informative of future profits, which we call V. And, and the motivated will again have these preferences we talked about. And so how does future profit depend on ESG? Well, it could be in principle increasing or decreasing. This lambda here uh, is a way of capturing if ESG is good or bad for profits. And so we can just think about it conceptually. The model works whether ESG is good, bad, or neutral for profits. But I think it's sort of interesting to think about whether we, we think it should be good or bad for profits. I think if you think about environmental issues, reducing waste is certainly economical. So for instance, you know, at AQR, if we stop using plastic bottles, you know, we save money doing that. So that was uh, environmental, but it was also economic. Uh, if you think about firms that, that produce something in a more environmentally friendly way, it's possible that the customers buying that product will pay more for that product or buy more products. So that could also be good for profits. But there could also be other cases where a firm may, may decide, should we just you know, clean up this mess or just put the poison in the lake? And maybe if nobody notices, maybe they make more profit if they just put the poison in the lake. That, you know, it could go both ways. In terms of social issues, we talked about it earlier. Uh, Alex Edmonds has this paper that higher employee satisfaction means to better firm performance. We also talked about that you know, not discriminating should in principle be good for profits. In terms of governance, it seems sort of almost self-evident that better governance, whatever it is, and, and, and obviously you know, measuring governance correctly is, is not necessarily straightforward, but, but we think that the better governance should lead to higher profits. But again, higher profits is not necessarily the same as higher returns, because returns depend both on how many profits you get, or how large profits you get, but also what you pay for them. And actually, uh, rather than going through all the math, let me just show you the result through this graph. In the paper, we can distinguish whether the market is dominated by ESG unaware investors, ESG aware investors, or ESG motivated investors. So let's start with the case where the market is dominated by ESG unaware investors. And, and let's assume, which is I think the typical case, that ESG is good for profits. So if we have a measure of ESG which is good for profits, and if investors are unaware, they ignore this, okay? So that means it doesn't affect the price. Price is, is unaffected, but better ESG firms are more profitable, therefore they're gonna deliver higher returns. So that's why we get, in this case of unaware investors, the, the blue line will be upward sloping, where we have the ESG score on the x-axis and the expected return on the y-axis. Okay, so in that case, it is true that yes, ESG is good for profits. But suppose now all investors are ESG and aware that they realize that good ESG is good for profits, therefore they bid up the price, and the price fully reflects that uh, the future profit will be higher. In that case, the future return will have no link between ESG and profit. You know, it'll, it'll be, if you are the, doing an IPO, it'll be good perhaps to be you know, high ESG because you can do the IPO at a high price, so that's good. But once the stock is out there, it's already trading at a high price and with the future high profits, the return going forward will be normal. So there will be no connection between ESG and, and returns. That doesn't mean it won't affect how capital is allocated, but, but it, it, it will have that shape. And then finally, in the case where the market is dominated by ESG motivated investors, we have that these investors not only will bid up the price of good ESG firms because they're more profitable, they will bid the price up even further because they have this separate preference for these stocks. In that case, the good ESG firms will become in that sense expensive, therefore the future return will, will be lower and we get this curve. Now all these are sort of in the long run equilibrium. If we are moving from a world where most people are unaware to a world where most people are ESG motivated, then in the short run, 
the, the stocks of, of high ESG firms will be bid up. And so even in, in, in that case, we'll see a short run, high return for the high ESG firms, even if we set that price increase up for lower long run return. Okay, so finally, let me show you some empirical data. And we consider four different measures of ESG. And again, our point is not that, that we should get the same result in each case. Rather, in fact, we, our point is that for every measure of ESG, you can think about, well, in that case, are people, are most investors aware about it? Are they unaware? Are they motivated to buy it even beyond the risk return profile? And we look at four measures. One is a measure of governance based on accounting accruals. It's one that has been shown to be associated with higher returns, so it's interesting to, to look at at least one measure of ESG where we have been finding very robust evidence uh, for you know, high good governance measured at, by this measure being associated with, with high returns. Then we look at uh, one of the main uh, commercial providers of ESG scores, the MSCI ESG score. We also look at carbon emissions, and uh, it says negated here because we, we try to sign all of them so a high number is good ESG. So a high negated carbon is, is low carbon emissions. And we talked earlier about scope one, scope two, scope three. Scope three data is still very, very noisy. So while theoretically it makes sense to include all three, we actually focus on scope one and scope two because we think the data quality is higher for those measures of carbon emission. And then we look at this issue of SIN and, and non-SIN stocks, where SIN stocks are defined by this paper by Hong and Kasparczyk as alcohol, tobacco, and gaming. Okay? So let's first issue, look at this question of does, do these things raise or lower returns? And so in each case, we want to understand do they predict profits and uh, are they associated with a large demand and a high price? And so for this measure of governance, what we find, and we have some big tables in the paper that uh, I won't show today, but, but they're there, but we find that this measure of governance is, does predict future profits, so better governance measures by accruals or low accruals will, will predict that the, these firms will be more profitable going forward, and we don't actually find much of a demand, in fact, for instance, as measured by institutional holdings and other measures of demand. So therefore, we would predict that uh, these stocks are perhaps fairly you know, cheap and, and have high returns. And that's what basically what we find in the data. Uh, in terms of these other measures, MSCI, ESG, carbon, and, and, and SIN, we find that there is evidence of, of higher institutional demand for these stocks. So the institutional investors prefer to buy perhaps you know, good ESG, low carbon, non-SIN stocks, uh, even though these measures are not strongly associated with future profits. So if they're not strongly associated with future profits, but they are associated with, with the demand that could affect the price, we might expect that these stocks become expensive or have low returns. And that's sort of what we find some evidence. It's not super strong. I think these, these ESG measures based on MSCI and, and carbon, it's a short time series. I think we, sh we should keep that in mind. There is some evidence that these stocks become expensive, but we don't really find anything in returns. The return evidence is very insignificant. In terms of sin, we don't find much in, in the pricing, and, and we find some evidence that non-sin stocks have lower returns that, than sin stocks, but again, it, it's not very strong, and it's not robust to controlling for things like the Pharma French five-factor model even if it is significant at the controlling for the Pharma French three-factor models. So the last thing I want to show is the empirical ESG efficient frontier. So we compute the ESG efficient frontier by every month simulating what would an unaware and an ESG aware and an ESG motivated investor choose if they look at the data and what we will assume here is that they look at the equity risk premium and the value effect. So they look at the book to uh, market uh, ratio of each stock, all of them. And then the ESG aware and motivated investor also look at this measure of governance, which I've just shown you predicts returns. 
Okay? So this is a case where ESG is useful. And, and then we simulate uh, their portfolio returns going forward through our sample. Okay? And what we find is that the, on the x-axis we have the ESG score, and on the y-axis we have the realized Sharpe ratio. So this is a simulation with real data. Here the ESG score is scaled differently, so in this case it goes from minus five to 15, but, but that's not so important. The point is here that the unaware investor, he thinks that good governance doesn't matter for performance, so he picks an ESG score close to zero. Zero is the average. So we've, we've signed, we've, we've made the ESG score so that zero is sort of the average stock by this metric. So he just says, I don't care about ESG, I'm gonna pick a portfolio with an ESG score which is average, which in this case zero. The ESG aware, he says, no, I'm actually, I think good governance is good for, for performance. I'm gonna pick an ESG portfolio, that, that a portfolio with an ESG score that is significantly above uh, average. And as a result, so these are the realized returns, and as a result, he actually does get a higher Sharpe ratio. And the, this uh, ESG motivated investor, he says, let me actually double the ESG score uh, rel uh, that, that A takes, let me make, go even further, in fact, double the amount. So to create sort of an equal distance between the three. And what we see is that this gives us sort of a very nice way of thinking about how they choose and the effect and the cost and the benefits. So in this case, and I'm not saying this is gonna be true for all ESG measures, but, but for this ESG measure, we can see that the, the key thing that investors often look at is the sharp ratio, we can look at what is the difference in sharp ratio between the unaware who ignores ESG information versus the aware investor who really exploits ESG information. And in this case, there's a sizable difference at 12% rise in sharp ratio because he's using that information or she's using that information. While this ESG motivated investor says, let's go even further, even I'm willing to give up some sharp how much sharp do you give up? Actually, in this case, uh, she only gives up 4% in terms of the sharp ratio when doubling the ESG score. So in this case, the curve is, is actually more flat on the right versus on the left because uh, going further to the right is sort of going out in a direction that is associated with, with, with good returns, even if you're distorting a little bit if, when you go out that far. So, Finally, if you have screens, we think that will actually, the more you screen, the lower you'll push down the ESG efficient frontier because you have fewer stocks to pick among, but also actually a, a screening investor might end up choosing a portfolio with a lower ESG score than a non-screening investor, which is very surprising, but, but actually screening can, can have some very interesting and surprising effects. So with that, let me leave some time for questions and we'll conclude that we think this new framework can be really helpful to optimize a portfolio's risk, return, and ESG together to evaluate the costs and benefits of ESG, to think about ESG integration in a, in a serious way, and we hope that it also sheds some new light on why certain things predict returns positively or other things predict returns negatively. So with that, let me open up for questions. Thank you. So if you could just put the slide where the risk return, the CAPM model is, please. I'm getting there, you can. Uh, yeah, so I mean, everybody have probably has this in mind actually. So my question is more about the assumptions on CAPM, that is CAPM assumes like uh, an efficient market where information is correctly priced in. So if I'm thinking of this from an optimal portfolio, which is at the tangent, even the ESG information would be kind of completely integrated. And you rightly pointed out that is you're working from that tangency to find out the, uh, the, the ESG portfolio. So my, my question is, you know, is ESG not just a premium which is already factored in? And the fact that because the market is already efficient, so that's already kind of priced in, so it's just a different way of looking at things. The, my, my resultant question is, 
when you're looking at the unaware ver versus the uh, the M, which stands for sorry the uh, the one which is more using impact or goes kind of a level further, is it not just a question of looking at risk? That is, maybe you know CAPM is not the best way of looking at it because that may not be efficiently captured in within uh, that framework. Thank you. So uh, you're right that it, it, we do uh, think about you know how these things are priced in the model. Now, in the case where the ESG unaware investors dominate the market, ESG information is not efficiently priced into into the stock price, and so we, the model actually does allow to sort of distinguish the case where this information is fully uh, priced in in a fully efficient market, and a case where the market is less than fully efficient because these unaware investors are dominating the market. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Richard Saldana, Oxquant. Um, I like the analysis. I think I understand the analysis. I'd probably uh, set this up in much the same way myself if I wanted to bias my portfolio in favor of ESG stocks. But it is incredibly stylized. And um, what I'm interested in are the, the real practicalities. And if you've, if you've considered it, um, if you've actually uh, generated portfolios that you've, you've invested in, in anger. Yeah, you're right. It is stylized like a, a typical academic paper. In real life, there are other issues. There are portfolio constraints. There are things like tracking error, what is the investor's benchmark, and so on. But yes, we, we do uh, have for many years actually been, been, been trading on this at AQR. We have experience with this. Uh, in, in different forms, and uh, you know, there's the case where ESG, you know, improves your performance, and, and I think uh, that's the case I focused on here, which which is great for the investor. You can sort of get higher returns in a more uh, high ESG portfolio. There are also cases where, let's say, ESG is very weakly related to returns, or maybe almost not related. In which case, this frontier becomes very flat. That's actually not bad news for the investor who really cares about it. It basically means you can get virtually the same Sharpe ratio, for instance, with much lower carbon. So if you think about carbon, not strongly related to returns, but you can have a portfolio with a much lower carbon footprint and almost the, the same Sharpe ratio. So what would be more hurtful to the investor if there was a strong negative relation to, to returns? And you know, if we're going to everybody being ESG motivated, you know, maybe we're going there, but I think we are very far from being there at this point. Well, thank you. Hi, um, John Belgrove from Aon. Um, oh gosh, I feel pretty awkward about this question, and. Um, I may have to ask for a taxi afterwards, but um, two years ago, Cliff Asnes was getting a lot of publicity for um, work which saying ESG may be good for the world, but it's bad for your portfolio. Two years later, we are witnessing your presentation. I'm interested in what the internal dialogue was that caused you to revisit that view. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, it's a bit of a caricature of, uh, of, of Cliff's statement. I think uh, our, our view has not changed. So our view is if, if you want to in, in, integrate ESG by having more constraints, then it is true that more constraint should theoretically uh, be reducing your returns. It's also true that if the market is fully efficient and, and many people really become ESG motivated, then, excuse me, then eventually it should lower returns. So we're still saying that, and that's, that's still true. And I think it makes, makes a lot of sense. That doesn't mean that it, it's the wrong thing to do, because it's important to remember if we, are, if we get to this case, then we are in a situation where because P investors are ESG motivated, they uh, accept a lower return for these you know, very sustainable firms, which on the flip side is sustainable firms have a lower cost of capital, and so good things can happen for the world. It's also true that ESG is 
informative about firm profits, and, and actually at AQR we've been trading on some of these signals for more than a decade, so well before Cliff made that statement. So I, I think he, he, uh, he was right in that, you know, there are cases where it will lower returns, and, and I think what he was also reacting to is that I think the, the proponents of ESG, some, some proponents, not all, but some want to insist that it can only be good that ESG is wonderful for the world and it must also, or in any case, maximize your return and your Sharpe ratio. And I, I think that is not correct and I think it's a little, you know, that insisting on something which is beyond what makes economic logically sense and what the empirical data supports actually hurts the case for sustainability, for sustainability really winning the, the debate and the argument among investors it, because it's not true, and I think people know in their heart it's not true that ESG is always good for profit. That's what my paper shows. It's not true. It can be true under some circumstances, and I think being honest about it is the way to win the debate. It's not to have this picture where you say, oh, it, of course it must be always good, because good is good and ESG is good. I, I just don't think that's the right way to win the debate. <laughs>